Hi guys, Mrs. Schacht here, and I'm here to discuss kind of a hodgepodge for you today, The Second Great Awakening, The Rise of Utopian Societies in Arts and Literature. So yes, there is a Second Great Awakening, and there are definitely similarities and differences between the first and the second, which I'll address in a moment. But I just want to remind you guys that during this time period, you see a huge economic and political shift during this time. We've got the rise of new technology and a market economy, and we also have more Americans, specifically men, participating in the political process. So those new changes do lead to some anxiety and fears for Americans. And so America is kind of primed for a religious revival. And so the Second Great Awakening is just that. It is a religious revival where people are going out and trying to convert Americans back to a more religious um, life. And it did gain a lot of popularity in the burnt over district of New York. Nothing burned down. Um, it just refers to the fact that everybody in this area of New York was converted. Um, it's going to lead to the rise of different religious um, groups, such as the Methodists and the Baptists, and it's going to lead to antebellum reforms, and I'll explain why that is in a moment. So if you compare the first and second Great Awakenings, obviously one difference is the time period, 1730s versus mostly 1820s and 1830s. While the first Great Awakening, um, I like to say, uses a lot of scare tactics like those fire and brimstone preachers, um, Jonathan Edwards, who wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, um, and tried to essentially scare people into um, getting back into the faith. Um, the Second Great Awakening was a little different. Um, this is a religious revival that's known for its outdoor camps and meetings. And literally, people would come, they would camp out by the tens of thousands, they would listen to preachers, um, they would confess their sins, and they would hopefully experience a conversion. Um, whereas the First Great Awakening kind of stressed this idea that you know, your salvation was kind of predetermined, but you could confess your sins and seek forgiveness. The Second Great Awakening kind of gave Americans a little more control over their destiny and said that, you know, by um, participating in good moral actions and behaviors, one could achieve salvation, um, which would make sense if, you know, they're preaching that people should be more moral in their beliefs and help others it would make sense that the Second Great Awakening would lead to reform movements. And so you're going to see groups of people that try to eradicate alcoholism, and you're going to see the rise of an abolitionist movement. And all of this is going to come from these religious beliefs. Another kind of big um, impact that the Second Great Awakening had is that it was accessible to women and African Americans as well. Again, women are going to be a part of these religious conversions, and they are going to be converted to religion by evangelists. Um, an evangelist, by the way, is just somebody who tries to convert you to a religion. But they will then question their place in society. And you're going to see how that leads to um, the women's suffrage movement in the late 1840s. So first and second Great Awakening, big takeaway is that there are outdoor meetings. Um, if you ever need a name, Charles Finney is a great reference. And while there's different denominations that are created and more women and African-Americans are involved, probably the biggest impact is the rise of antebellum reform movements. You do also see the creation of a religion that is still around today and very prominent in Utah, and that is the Mormon faith. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was founded by Joseph Smith in 1830, and the Mormons followed a book that he wrote called the Book of Mormon. Um, he was ostracized from New York and other states before settling in Illinois, where he was assassinated in 1844. And so a gentleman by the name of Brigham Young took the Mormons out to Utah, where they um, settled in Salt Lake City. And if you go to Utah today, not only will you see Brigham Young University, but you will see a very prominent Mormon presence. There were also groups of people who were 
again, maybe just concerned about the materialism of a new market economy and the changes happening and wanted to create kind of a utopia, a perfect place where people could live without outside influence or outside corruption and controversy. So there were over 80 uh, utopian communities created in the 1840s alone. Um, they were communal societies, so people typically shared the land and shared the resources. And probably the most prominent or famous was the Oneida, um, again created in New York in 1848. Um, they did believe in social and economic equality. Um, they shared all the resources, um, including marriage partners, which became very scandalous and controversial for a time. Um, but they also created, oddly enough, a bunch of silverware. And Oneida silverware is still around today. Um, I bet if you maybe even check your kitchen drawers, you might find some forks and knives created by the Oneida. Um, it is a company that's still around today. You also have another example would be the Shakers. Um, they also shared property and resources, but believed in keeping women and men separate and achieved about 6,000 members in the 1840s. That sort of utopian community also kind of transcends into the arts and literature world. And so arts and literature sees a major shift during this time period as well. And you see the rise of a movement called transcendentalism. So for those of you that are in American literature or AP Lang, my guess is that you will learn about this this year if you haven't already done so. But many transcendentalists were inspired by this romantic movement happening in Europe, um, that focused a lot on inward reflection, um, that everybody had the ability um, to be good at the core, and that maybe, you know, life was becoming too materialistic. Again, makes sense in a new kind of economy. And so we've just got to focus our attention inward and not be influenced by outside resources. Um, several, you probably may recognize Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, um, but many intellectuals actually did create a utopian community known as Brook Farm in 1841, where there was this kind of communal uh, living situation among many writers and artists. And many very prominent works of literature were also written during this time. So you might be familiar with The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, um, The Last of the Mohicans, um, Edgar Allan Poe, The Pit and the Pendulum, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne and The Scarlet Letter. So these are all works that are coming out of the transcendentalist movement. But the two biggest names are Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Um, Emerson's a big believer in self-reliance um, and the importance of just focusing on oneself and not being distracted by outside influences. And Henry David Thoreau um, also kind of took this a step further and really kind of created a life simply based in peace and nature. And so for about two and a half years, Henry David Thoreau built a little cabin by himself and he lived by himself on a pond um, called Walden Pond. And then he wrote about his experiences and, you know, just the reflections that he had living by himself um, out in nature and again, just relying on himself and himself only for survival. Although legend has it that his mom lived like next door. So I don't know how terribly alone he really was, but you may be familiar with that. Um, you also see a new school of art that is created um, and also inspired by Europeans. Um, this becomes known as the Hudson River School of Art. And so as you guys can see, many of these artists um, were very famous for painting landscapes. And if you kind of take a look at them, you know, the landscapes really give off a very peaceful vibe. Um, and typically the Hudson River School of Art focused on landscapes that had a theme of either exploration or new beginnings, or you can kind of like up here see the contrast between the dark and the light. And so again, um, focusing on nature and this transcendentalist movement also spilled over into art. Um, wouldn't be a video without some vacation photos. So if you guys ever find yourselves in Boston, rent a car, go to Concord, Massachusetts. You can visit all sorts of graveyards, including the, the gravestone of the Thoreau family. And I've actually dipped my feet into the Walden Pond. Um, as you can see, it's now a beach 
Um, it's not very peaceful, I'll be honest, but it is beautiful nonetheless. So check it out if you're ever in the Boston area. All right, guys, that's it for me. Hope you have a great day.